Hello, in this video, I want to talk about where words get their meaning from. Where do words get their meaning from? So we're talking hermeneutics here. Uh, and um, as you'll see in a moment, I feel like uh, the real breakthrough here uh, happened with uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and so I think there's a certain common sense to it, uh, to his approach. Uh, and we'll see if you agree with me. So let's go ahead and begin. Antecedents uh, to Wittgenstein. Uh, I'm going to divide up the hermeneutics of meaning into pre and post uh, Wittgenstein, if you would. So Augustine, uh, uh, Wittgenstein talks about Augustine in his book, Philosophical Investigations. And he portrays Augustine as having what he calls a picture theory of language. Now, this may not be completely accurate because after all, Augustine was not actually trying to um, come up with a meta kind of hermeneutic um, necessarily. Um, it just kind of, he has his way of talking about uh, meaning uh, as he's on his way to other things. But this, this idea of a picture theory of language is actually what Wittgenstein earlier had pretty much uh, presupposed with regard to meaning. What we mean here is that I say something like dog, and you picture in the bubble above your head a dog as the referent uh, to it. And so for every, for every word, you have a picture, and that's the meaning of the word. So I say uh, fire truck, you know, and you picture a fire truck, and that's the meaning of the word fire truck. And Augustine had, or uh, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, somewhat had this approach to language in his earlier uh, work. And, and then, of course, uh, one of his friends, uh, did an uh, Italian friend, I think it was, did some sort of an Italian gesture, uh, maybe the Italian version of the finger, and said, hey, uh, in so many words, picture this, Ludwig. Um, and um, um, not that it was a big breakdown. I like to picture Wittgenstein as saying, my whole philosophy is, is messed up. <laughs> but um, it certainly... You don't, if I, if, I, if I say the word is, or the word righteousness, what, what is the picture that it corresponds to? And, and actually, uh, the idea that, um, and, and this really goes into a, a, a guy by the name of Paul Ricoeur, that um, a, a sentence, Ricoeur would say, is not merely adding up the individual meanings of the individual words. A sentence is a different level of meaning than a singular a word, and that the sum of those words is bigger than the parts. And so uh, Wittgenstein realized uh, that this picture theory of language is, is not adequate, that there's something different happening uh, in language than merely us uh, plugging in a picture uh, for every word in a sentence. Now, uh, uh, much later than Augustine, so Augustine is around 400, uh, and in fact, Wittgenstein knew Gottlob Frege. Uh, Frege had this, uh, this sense uh, that uh, the, meaning, the language basically worked by uh, a word would have a sense, and then it would have a reference. And, and this was you know, kind of uh, also in the backdrop, I think, of Wittgenstein's early sense of language. That when I say, when I say a word like uh, language, that there is a sense to the word, and, and, and it refers to something in the maybe in the real world or maybe in an imaginary kind of narrative world. Uh, but the, there's a sense to the word, and then there's the reference of, of the word. Well, um, in this general uh, train of thought, there's also a, a French guy um, who um, died in 1913, so he straddles the centuries there. But Ferdinand de Saussure uh, basically said that uh, words, the meaning of words has to do with uh, the, the word itself, which is a signifier, and a signified, which is the thing uh, to which it points. This kind of sounds like Frege's approach, but it's not actually exactly the same. And so the way we, the, the thing is, for, for, for de Saussure, there is no necessary relationship between the word and what it signifies. It's completely arbitrary. Um, so the word book, um, b -u -k, you know, that, those, those sounds that, that make up the signifier, um, you know, if you go to someone in another language and you say book, they, they'll have no idea what you mean, right? 
Um, there's no necessary relationship between those sounds, the signifier, and the thing that you're, you know, you're referring to, uh, the signified. Uh, and so um, what, what happens is with the saucer, uh, be, because there's an arbitrary relationship, uh, he sets up a kind of train of thought that will eventually end up with a school known as deconstruction uh, that Derrida, Jacques Derrida uh, is perhaps the most famous uh, a proponent. Uh, at, because if, if there's an arbitrary relationship between words and what, they, uh, what they're talking about, um, then, uh, then there's, you, you can, there's, there's not necessarily anything to ground the meaning of the, of the signifier. Okay. Well, these are all antecedents and people that you should have heard of at some point in a hermeneutics uh, course. But now let's get to Wittgenstein. All of all this other stuff is very interesting, but let's get to something that's actually uh, really uh, uh, real here. So uh, Wittgenstein, uh, he was an Austrian. Uh, he was a very strange man. Um, I, I get the feeling he was probably very annoying, clearly a genius, which is why everybody put up with him and kept inviting him to things. Uh, but but quite annoying, I get the impression. I won't go much uh, more into into him. But here's basically what he came up with in the end: that the meaning of words is in how they are used. And so, um, a word like dog, you you don't you don't know what the word dog means unless you have a context in which that that um, word is placed. So if I say Look, there's a dog crossing the, you know, there's a dog out there. So that's a very basic, you know, use of the word dog, where I actually am referring to a dog outside. And, you know, you can picture the dog, and, and even my sentence is, is simply pointing it out. But um, if I say, if I'm in a car, and a dog walks out in front of the car, and I say, dog, um, I'm actually saying, uh, Put on your brakes so you don't hit the car. Now, I'm going a little beyond Wittgenstein here into my next uh, two slides from now, uh, what, what is called a speech act theory. But basically, Wittgenstein says, and this, again, I don't know how you argue against this, that the meaning of a word isn't how it's used. And so um, I often use the example of the word fire. You know, I could say, son, that's called a fire. And that's a most basic kind of indicating use of the word. But there are lots of other uses of the word fire. Um, I can come in from a blizzard and sit in front of the, the fireplace and say, fire. You know, um, my, what I'm saying is not really, this red stuff is called a fire. That's not, that's not really the meaning of my words. The meaning is, oh, that feels so good because I'm cold. Even though I don't say all those words, if I come in and I say, fire. If you, know, if you know the language game I'm playing and the particular form of life, so the form of life is I've just come in from a blizzard. And the, so the, 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 it's, and the game has to do with um, uh, cold, hot, you know, or whatever. And so you know what I mean. If I, if I run into a crowded room and say, fire, what I'm really saying is you better get out of here quick or you're going to die. Um, you know, I'm saying there is a life-threatening uh, substance uh, or uh, uh, thing going on in, in this building. So you see how uh, there are different um, meanings to the word depending on, you know, the, the particular con context is everything, right? Let's say uh, that it, it, we're talking the, the form of life is um, uh, employment, and someone says, you're fired. Now there, what they're, they're not ha talking about red stuff or orange stuff at all. They're basically saying, uh, you, you no longer work here. Um, let's say that I'm in front of a firing squad or I'm on a firing squad and someone says, ready, aim, fire. Again, that's something uh, completely uh, different. Um, let's say I go to a football game and I get all fired up. You know, these are uh, distinct meanings to the same word uh, and and how, what are these different meanings? Well, it, it's, it's a matter of context. It's a matter of the usage. It's the matter of the game that, that I'm playing. This makes so much sense. I don't know how you would argue against it. So the dictionary entries are really popularity contests. The number one entry is the most common use of the word. And the number two entry is the second most common use 
of, of the word and so forth. And so um, uh, the meaning is in how, how they're used. So the word is, when I learn, learn English, I subconsciously learn how to use the word is. Um, it doesn't refer to anything. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form uh, that I use. Um, when, I use, when should I use the? When should I not use the? This is, this is part of the flow. Uh, a lot of those words don't even, may not even have a specific meaning. They're a convention. Uh, they're a usage, uh, so to speak. Well, um, some of the word fallacies that you might learn uh, in an inductive Bible study class follow straight upon, you know, this sense of what words mean. So, for example, the fallacy of anachronism is when you use a meaning of a word that it simply didn't have, you know, at a previous time. So uh, in the, um, you know, you talk about the, um, the gay 20s, for example. Is that, a, is that an expression? Well, it had nothing to do with homosexuality because the word gay did not mean homosexual uh, until the late 20th century. Uh, um, gay 90s, I think, might, uh, 1890s might have been uh, a phrase at one time. So when you use a word uh, uh, when, you, when you assume that a word back here ma means what it means now, well, the use changes. New meanings come into play. Old meanings pass uh, uh, out. Um, at first, they go into archaic in the dictionary, and then they just stop, stop printing them. So uh, because the use of words changes, the meaning of words changes. The inherited pronunciation of my name is skank. Uh, S-C-H-E-N-C-K. And so my, my dad was Melvin Skank, um, and I'm, I'm Ken Skank. Uh, but uh, in recent days, I've started pronouncing it, instead of the Dutch way, I've, been, I've started pronouncing it more the German way, Shank. Why? Because the females in my family don't want to be Skanks. Now, in high school, well, you must have been uh, teased about that in high school, Ken. No, it simply didn't mean that. Those sounds did not mean that. Uh, in the 80s when I was in high school. It wasn't until the late 90s that I began to notice this particular use of words. The word Google, you know, if, if you'd have told somebody to Google something in 1990, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about. Maybe an astute mathematician would say, are you talking 10 to the 100th power, a Google? Um, but you see, words come in, words go out. This is why those who think they understand the King James may not actually really understand the King James as well as they think, because uh, the King James even was updated um, from 1611 to the late 1700s, its language was update, updated. Because even in that uh, 150 years, uh, the meanings of words had changed. Uh, and so um, uh, the meaning of a word today is in how the word is used today. And so um, you, the meaning now um, is not, the meaning 10 years ago may not be the same as it is now. That's the fallacy of anachronism. The etymological fallacy is the assumption that what a word meant, uh, so anachronism is what a word means now, or what a, what a word means in the future, isn't necessarily what it meant at this point. The etymological fallacy says the historical meaning of a word isn't necessarily what the meaning is today, or um, you can't necessarily break apart the parts of a word and it tell you what the word means. So like ecclesia, you hear this all the time, is uh, the church, the ecclesia, are those who are called out. Well, I don't know that anybody really thought about that by the time of Paul. It was a word, like understanding. Very few people talk about standing under something when they understand it. There are, I've seen it, but it's, it's not common. Uh, this is the etymological fallacy. What a word has meant in the past doesn't necessarily tell you what it means Today, um, especially when you go back way into the distant uh, past, this is a word fallacy. The meaning of a word today is a, a function of how it's being used uh, today. Now, of course, there's a little bit of uh, history behind how it's used today sometimes. Um, it, it can go back, it can reach back a little bit, um, but, but it's not determinative. What a word meant 10 years ago is not determinative of what a word means today because the use can change. The, the lexical fallacy, the kind of the, there's, there's not necessarily a core meaning to a word <coughs> that plays itself out every time that word is used. Take the word fire. Now, we can, we can, we can go back and find out, we, we can at least hypothesize how the word fire, you know, came to mean all these different things. But in, in use today, 
People don't think about that. When people use the word fire in this context and in this context, uh, they don't think, okay, what's the core meaning of the word fire here that's playing itself out every time the word is used? We just, we use words and, and, and they, they branch over time and we don't know, you know the origins. You don't have to know the etymology of a word to use it properly or to, or to define it. Um, so the, 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 the core meaning of a word um, there is no necessary, no necessary core meaning uh, to a word that plays itself out. That's just not the way words work. And of course, the one meaning fallacy. Words often take on multiple uh, meanings. Um, so you can see how the word fallacies that you learned about in inductive Bible study really are just playing out uh, the, the fundamental sense that the meaning of a word is how it is used in a particular context. That is all. And so, if there if there are uh, if there are universal meanings to words, it can only be because in every context the use is the same. And let's let's it's going to be hard to find uh, instances like that. Okay, uh, now this um, this is another thing that Wittgenstein said that um, maybe goes a little bit beyond what we're talking about here, but I'm going to go ahead and throw it in here, and that is that much of reality doesn't, this relates to the lexical fallacy, much of reality does not reduce to essences that play themselves out in every form. And so Plato and Aristotle talked as if, you know, for everything, there is some essence of the thing. This is not at all always the case. Uh, so for example, uh, well, groupings, groupings of things sometimes involve a set of general characteristics not all of which are present in every member of the group. Let me use my own family as an example. So uh, Shanks, let's say, that, let's say that, that the Shank family likes to talk a lot. Um, and let's say uh, that, that um, a lot of Shanks have big ears. Um, and let's say that a lot of Shanks have these little jowls, you know, here. Um, now, uh, does that mean that, well, look at that. Uh, Sister Sue over there doesn't have jowls. She's not truly a member of the Shank family. Or, or have you noticed that Brother Bob doesn't talk much at all? He must not be a true Shank. You know, so there is no universal Shank. Um, now maybe DNA, we could we could begin to talk about that. But in terms of visible characteristics, there is no oh all Shanks have those characteristics. Rather, there is a, co a collection of characteristics. And some shanks have some, and some shanks have others. And so um, there is a tendency for people to reduce things to essences, as if every man is this way, or every woman is this way, uh, or every um, you know, person of this race is this way. And it's simply not the case uh, that, that this is, of course, where prejudice comes from, that, that reality is much more collections of family resemblances um, without a kind of es essential uh, grouping uh, than um, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, of, of uh, cookie cutter, everything's like this. Plato and Aristotle really, uh, in this sense, are, um, they're not as profound, in my opinion, uh, as, uh, as say the v Wittgenstein is here. Plato and Aristotle, uh, honorable mention, Nice of you. I'm sure you. I know. I'm sure people thought you were smart. But when it comes to this idea of universals uh, that that Plato and Aristotle were looking for, they really weren't quite as sophisticated as this this uh, sense of family resemblances uh, that Wittgenstein uh, came up with. Okay. Well. So, uh, what is the essential insight to the meaning of words here? That the meaning of words is in how they are used. Uh, in a particular context, and that this is something that um, develops over time. And we kind of, we can't control where it goes, really. Uh, in fact, take the word literal, um, the, the expression, this literally, you know, we use this a lot in English. Now, the word literally originally meant uh, that the words are being used in their normal sense. And so as I talk about in the metaphor video that goes with this, this uh, uh, group of three videos, um, in the metaphor group, I talk about how if I say he, he literally went through the ceiling, um, in the proper use of the word literally, 
if he literally went through the ceiling, then he's dead, right? Because his head's he, he cracked his neck, you know. Um, but the, the dictionary has added that one of the meanings of literally is figuratively. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've used the word literally so often to mean um, not literally, <laughs> or we've used the word literally. It, actually, it's, it's, its meaning is more like really. He really went through the roof. That's what we're, we're really saying. It's not what we're literally saying. It's what we're really saying. And, and so the dictionary, you know, we tell the dictionary what these words mean. And so many people have used the word literally to refer to what really happened, um, that uh, the word literally doesn't mean literally uh, in that sense. And so uh, it's a frustrating thing, but words change and there ain't nothing your English teacher can do about it. Um, so the meaning of a word is the way it's used in a particular context. Now, a development of Wittgenstein was done by J.L. Austin. Um, his classic work is a little book, uh, How to Do Things with Words. And this is, the, uh, this is basically uh, an elaborate, it's not a contradiction, but it's an elaboration of what Wittgenstein uh, said. So words function in different ways. Uh, so some words are statements, some words are questions, some words are commands, some words are promises. Some words are expressions. There, there are lots of different things that we can do with words. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, walk by someone and we'll say, how are you? And um, maybe they'll respond or maybe they'll say, fine, how are you? And um, I've, I've heard pastors um, chastise uh, a congregation for not waiting to hear the answer to how are you. But upon a little reflection, uh, you shouldn't feel too guilty. Because the, the question, uh, what, does the, what, does the, what does the phrase how are you mean, is not, the meaning of how are you is not in the meaning of how, and the meaning of are, and the meaning of you. But the meaning of the expression how are you is the way that sent that question is used in a particular context. So how do we use in English the, the question, how are you? Well, I would argue that the overwhelming majority of the time when we say, how are you, we're saying, hello, I like you. And that in fact, the, the use of that expression is not as a question at all. Now, of course, it, uh, it's perfectly legitimate to answer it and say, I'm doing fine, or to say, you know what, I'm having a really bad day. There's no problem with doing that, but in my opinion, the conversation immediately changes. The, the question, most of the time, is not a question. It's a social greeting. And so when someone says, I'm having a really bad day, it flips the context. Immediately, the language game changes. It's no longer the language game of social nicety and of interrelationships. Now, suddenly, the conversation is one of information uh, and of concern and of uh, being responsive. I've watched this. I, I saw someone uh, not, not too long ago uh, kind of jokingly say, how did this, how did this routine procedure go? And it, the, the, the language game initially was, let's joke about uh, procedures, physical procedures we go through that we don't really want to, and ha, 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 ha. And so it started out as that kind of a language game. But then when the person said, well, actually, they found something, wow, the entire language game changed to one of concern and of friendship. So, so um, basically, the pastors are wrong when they chastise you for not waiting to hear the answer to how are you, because they don't understand how language works. That is a social uh, use of the word, not a real question, until it is, and then it's a real question. And so stop feeling guilty when someone tries to beat you with a wet noodle. Okay, so um, by the way, a wild goose chase. Um, uh, until I started studying the meaning of words, I never once pictured a goose uh, when, I, when somebody said, oh, that's a wild goose chase. I never even thought about a goose uh, when someone said that. Um, uh, so, because it's a dead metaphor, um, it means what it means. We know how it's used. We don't necessarily picture a goose. In fact, a lot of times with dead metaphors like that, um, when 
when someone actually, uh, when it actually becomes literal, we laugh. <laughs> look, he's actually on a wheel. Well, you know, if I were to look out my window and see one, someone chasing a goose, a literal goose, I might laugh and say, look, he's, he's really on a wild goose chase. And it'd be funny because that's not really the use of that expression. Okay, so uh, let me go a little bit into speech act theory. Um, so look, uh, speech act theory uh, distinguishes the locution, which is the words that are said, from the illocution, which is the intention of the author in the words that are being said, and then the per perlocution, which is the effect of the words on, on, on who it's being said to. I preached uh, in chapel uh, this past Monday, and someone asked me uh, how, I, how it went. And I basically said, I, 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 I had this fresh on the brain, and so I basically said the locution uh, went the way, came out the way I wanted it to. So I had planned the sermon, right? I had planned certain words. I don't, I don't like preaching with a manuscript. It, it, it makes the sermon boring. I, I think like nine out of 10 times preaching from a manuscript makes the sermon less alive and, and bores the, the uh, congregation. Now, you don't have to agree with me, but I'm, I guarantee you that if I were to watch, you know, 10 manuscript sermons, I personally am going to um, feel like that for, for most of them. But anyway, so, but I did plan out what I was going to say. Um, and so my first, the first thing I said was, well, the, the locution went the way I wanted it to because I said um, what, I, what I wanted to say. The illocution, of course, the, the purpose, the, what was the purpose behind those words? Well, I was hoping um, that I would express well uh, the, need, the, the sense that you need to be born from above, that until we are born from above, uh, we, we are, as it were, not truly alive. We're like the walking dead until, until the Spirit uh, gives life to us. And so I had a certain intended force uh, for the locution. I had an intention. Now, the perlocution, I said, I don't know what that was. I don't know what effect I necessarily had. I don't know whether um, uh, the, those who were listening uh, to the sermon uh, responded in the way that I had intended for them uh, to respond. So, but this, this is a way of looking at speech acts uh, that helps clarify uh, various things. So there is the what that is said, there is the intention of the author in what is said, and then there's the effect on the audience on what is said. The thing, of course, is, is that um, it is, there is a certain disconnect between the intention of the author and the words that actually come out. And so there's a disconnect, as we'll talk about in the third video, which is the meaning of texts. Uh, this is the first video on the meaning of words. The second video is the meaning of metaphors. And then the third video is the meaning of texts. Um, so there's a, a bit of a disconnect uh, between uh, the locution, uh, the illocution and the locution. And there's a big disconnect often between the perlocution and the illocution. Okay, a little bit of speech act theory there. Now, uh, I'm going to save the topic of genre uh, for uh, uh, another day, maybe not even ever on video, although I do have some videos that, that actually uh, have, have played this out without me spelling it out. But you can see that um, when we use a word like infallible, when we say that scripture is infallible, what we're saying is that scripture never fails uh, in God's illocution. That, what, that God's purposes for Scripture will never fail. Now, the problem is, is that we have our ideas of what we think God wants to do in Scripture. And most of the time, we don't stop and say, what if I actually am wrong about what I think God was trying to do through the Scripture? A lot of the debates that we've had over, over Scripture uh, in the late 20th century basically assumed that God's illocution was a certain thing. Well, that's something that we have to talk about. That's something that can be debated. Um, and so, but, but certainly Isaiah 55, 11, God's word does not return unto him void. Scripture does not fail in God's illocution. It is infallible. Now, what are some of these illocutions? Well, I would say to know the illocution of Scripture uh, various scriptures, you need to know how, how the genres of Scripture function. So, for example, take narratives, the narratives of Scripture. One of the functions of the narratives of Scripture was surely to establish and to reinforce the identity 
of the people of God. And so this is one of the things that the narratives of Scripture do, what God's intentions for Scriptures were, I would argue. Namely, that Scriptures tell us who we are as the people of God. They tell us what our story is. They tell us where we're at in that story. I would say that um, another primary feature of Scripture is to move us uh, toward and away from certain co courses of action. So, for example, thou shalt not kill tells me that I shouldn't kill. Uh, so uh, a lot of, of Scripture involves these kinds of injun injunctions or instructions. And I would say that even the narratives of Scripture have an ethical uh, implication often, uh, that they're not just simply telling us what happened. In fact, I would say that telling us what happened is a, a secondary function of the narratives of Scripture, that, that knowing how, scriptures function, uh, how narratives function in their own time and context leads us to see the purpose of Scripture as much more ethical and much more identic, identity forming uh, than, um, uh, than uh, simple historical narration. I'm not denying that they narrate history. I'm just saying I don't think that was their primary uh, function. Uh, certainly, Scriptures provide hope. There are promises in Scripture. Uh, scripture provides uh, encouragement. Scripture provides uh, a, me a catharsis, a mechanism for expression. When we're angry, they're the imprecatory psalms. When we're sad, they're the psalms of lament. These are emotive functions of Scripture, which are just as important uh, as maybe the cognitive functions. Uh, I just said that. It expresses very emotions. Now, there are times when the purpose of Scripture is to inform, and in that time, the illocution is without error. Um, do you see how this is a much more, more um, um, uh, complex, yes, but, but this is a breakdown of the purposes of, of Scripture that is much more in keeping with the actual nature of the genres of Scripture and what the, the, the usual illocution uh, of those sorts of genres uh, is. Uh, well, this is what I, uh, what I have uh, in this particular video on the meaning of words. Bottom line, the meaning of words is how they are used and how they are used in a particular context. I don't see any way to argue against that. I really don't. I don't think, you know, you may come up with a, a more complicated theory, but I bet even if we were to get into your complicated theory, we would find that the meaning of the words in your complicated theory is a function of how those words are used in that complicated theory. Uh, and so the meaning of a word is in how they're used. The meaning of a word is not connecting a word to some platonic universal that's in God's mind. Now, God has universal truth in his mind. I completely believe that. But all human expressions of language are ensconced in forms of life down here. And so God comes down to us and speaks our language. If God spoke his language, we wouldn't understand him, um, at least not in a kind of cognitive way. Now, I, won't, I, I don't want to get into um, um, kind of intuitions of God or people who speak in tongues where there may be something on a different level happening there. But when it comes to human language, as soon as we begin to express those intuitions in human language, we have begun to um, to uh, uh, ensconce them within language games that are the product of forms of life. Of course, in my next video, I talk about the meaning of metaphors. Metaphors are the way to move beyond kind of the ordinary uses of words into new uh, uses of words. Well, I'll stop there. This has been a video on the meaning of words.